Hello and welcome to North 100, a Canadian Highlander podcast. I'm Serge. Joining me today, I have a Jer. Hello. And a Wheeler. Ahoy. Reminder that North 100 is brought to you by you with your support over at the Patreon, over at patreon.com slash loading ready run. Welcome to part one of our Strixhaven set review. Reminder, we do Canadian Highlander set reviews, so these are not exhaustive. Instead, we just talk about the cards that we think are relevant to the format or that we think are interesting to talk about. We're going to go through colors. Today, we're going to aim to hit white, blue, and red to see how we think these cards are going to affect the format or not affect the format, if we think they might be a trap or something like that. And it's worth mentioning, we're also going to be including the cards from the Commander Pre-cons? Is that what those things are called? Yeah, the Commander 2021 pre-cons that have a connection to Strixhaven, much like how the Commander 2020 pre-cons had a connection to Akoria. Excellent. Well, why don't we start with one of those Commander cards then? Let's talk about Angel of Ruins. This is a 7-mana, 5-7 artifact angel for 5 white-white as flying. And when it enters the battlefield, exile up to two target artifacts and or enchantments. And it also plane cycles for two, which means two and discard this card. Search your library for a planes card, notably not a basic planes card, any planes card. Hello, dual lands. Reveal it, put it into your hand and then shuffle. Wheeler, start us off. What do you think? So initially when I saw this card, I just my mind went to like big white jokes because it Fair. is a large white card. It's no eternal dragon, but plane cycling's not bad. But I actually think that this probably has a home in either like a Boros Wildfire kind of stacks variant deck or like a Boros Welder deck, you know, something that looks to bring back giant artifact creatures through Goblin Welders, Duretti, that kind of stuff, just because it checks off so many boxes, be it from the fact that it's just hitting for five and as flying, as well as a nice booty that gets past, you know, all the other large flying creatures that you'll typically run into, you know, dragons. It's able to hit some problem permanent types that don't exactly get dealt with by a wildfire style card can also stop you know they're in snaring bridge or moat's not going to stop this because it's an angel but you know they're in snaring bridge i guess and it puts itself into the graveyard so like you need to get your cards into your graveyard if you're looking to bring them back and this does it all by itself while also finding you know what is most likely your splash color which you know you said that it doesn't have to find a basic planes But worth noting that if you're a deck that has, well, Blood Moon effects, such as those Welder decks might have, uh, you can search up a Basic Planes off of any color of mana, put this in the graveyard, you have both your colors, and now you got this big angel you can reanimate later on. So yeah, I, I think this card just happens to somehow check off all these boxes for these two somewhat niche decks. Fantastic. All right, let's move on to Detention Vortex. This is a single white for an enchantment aura. Enchant non-land permanent. Enchanted permanent can't attack or block, and its activated abilities can't be activated. But activated ability, three mana, destroy Detention Vortex. Only your opponent may activate this ability, and only as a sorcery. I'll uh, throw this one to myself. Thanks, me. (laughs) I like this basically only an enchantress one of the decks that wants to have very cheap enchantments to cantrip off of while in the later game your opponents will be able to deal with this pretty reliably oftentimes where enchantress struggles the most is setting up quickly getting a certain threshold of stuff down to get extra mana off the sarah sanctum and really having more cheap enchantments to cantrip off of enchantresses to sort of start to go off and this card kind of checks off all those boxes it's not sexy it's not extremely powerful but i think it's definitely worth trying out if you're playing against a lot of aggressive decks you just need to buy yourself a turn or draw a card for uh, pretty cheap there all right next up let's move on to devastating mastery this is a sorcery for two and a white 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 six mana but you may also spend two white white rather than pay the spell's mana cost if two white white cost was paid an opponent chooses up to two non-land permanents they control and return them to their hand. Destroy all non-land permanents. Jer, as a resident control expert, what do you think of this new wrath? I think the alternate cost, like the downside on the alternate cost, is often going to be too too big of a downside to make it worthwhile for the average case. Like on average, you you might only be wrathing two things. So like the fact that it can't wrath two things for four mana means it's probably not good enough and also 
planar cleansing just has never made a made a big splash in the format like you want to be able to play cast out detention sphere planeswalkers those types of things and often the most powerful thing you can do is like play a planeswalker force your opponent to commit and then wrath and this doesn't enable that play pattern either so i don't think it fits into most of the typical wrath decks that we have in the format Moving on, we have Dig Site Engineer. This is a three mana dwarf artificer for two and a white. It's a three three and says, whenever you cast an artifact spell, you may pay two generic. If you do, create a zero zero colorless construct artifact creature token with this creature gets plus one plus one for each artifact you control. Wheeler, what do you think? So we've all heard of medium red, medium green, maybe you've even heard of medium blue and black. And medium white isn't as much of a thing because as much as we try to say, you know, just play this is not exactly a good mentality to have. You Medium white and death and taxes, the lo- it's just so close. Like you're basically just choosing to play death and taxes, but you want to have more four drops and five drops and probably some angels in there or whatever but i'm starting to think that now with more cards like this you know there is a real identity and it's just kind of like a workshop aggro sort of deck like you have my attention (laughs) right it's a single pip card it's a three three which three three for three not winning any awards but it's that's pretty reasonable and it just triggers off you casting any artifacts and that's not a once per turn ability. So if you're casting Moxin or, you know, cheap equipment, skull clamps and whatnot, you can just pay an extra two to get a Karn struct, right? Like the tokens created by Karn, the uh, one from Dominaria or Urza. And those things get large. They get big, they get plentiful. And that's just kind of scary and feels like it fits right into something that white can do especially with equipment i'm still thinking we're getting this is a deck that i've been keeping my eye on for a bit is just dwarf red white artifacts matter yeah. and like in a slightly different direction from just workshop winnie or the artifact aggro decks we're going because there are some very interesting cards of like whatever dwarf becomes tapped or look reveal the top x card of your library style effects and that density isn't quite there and they just keep printing more though right yeah i don't know <laughs> i'm with you on that somewhat if we replace the word dwarf with equipment i think i'm what? more there <laughs> i've been wait, what do you mean almost there i've been playing that deck for like four years no but i mean like just slowing it down a little bit mm. oh not as all in yeah i'm leaving my ornithopter at home sort of uh, thing but just like <laughs> and i'm not using that as a dig at you because lord know, knows know. i've played that deck for whatever reason what what about hover mirror ben my, oh god <laughs> So <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Thank you. So we're so far past that. But yeah, I'd be what I mean is like slow it down a bit. Just I'm really talking like, hey, less zero drops, more, you know, one or two drops. Well, make it mid range. Don't make it all in. Because the problem with that deck, and I can acknowledge this, is I can make some of the most powerful seven card hands in the format but it's inconsistent it's comically inconsistent it's it's like a house of cards right and that's what i think this deck has gained is consistency because if you start adding you know these red and white equipment based tutors of which we have a lot and you start adding more cards like this that provide added benefits if you just have these low cost artifacts that are purely there to accelerate you that's great like anything that turns your dead draws into live draws later is fantastic and i i think we're at that point where this deck exists and cards like this are really going to push it forward i I really resonates with the turn your dead draws into live draws later is an excellent way of phrasing that yeah a little bit of an engine more value value and we do love value Mm. (laughs) all right let's move on next up elite spellbinder is a three mana three one human cleric for two and a white as flying and when it enters the battlefield look at target opponent's hand you may exile a non-land card from it. For as long as that card remains exiled, its owner may play it, but a spell cast this way costs two generic more to cast. Jer, what do you think? I think this is a pretty cool PVDDR likeness card. They're no longer invitational cards, I guess. But yeah, it's pretty cool. I think the fact that it has flying means it's good enough to see play. It is a little fragile, but ideally you can hit the thing that slows and trips up your opponent the most like you can hit a wrath you can hit a key key combo piece or you can hit something that can sort of invalidate this on the battlefield 
So it's a it's a flyer. It holds equipment well. I I think it's going to be worthwhile. What deck do you think this is going into? I think you could easily play this in in Death and Taxes. I think you could play it in like a green white or black white hate bear style deck. And I don't think it's ridiculous to play it in like like kind of like blue white tempo y style deck either. It sort of fits fits in that that shell as well. Like Aether Viling this in is is pretty nice. It's another tool for Esper humans. <laughs> I thought you were going to say clerics, but... No. I mean, speaking of clerics, though, let's move on to the Lannan Light Scribe. Two mana, two, two cat cleric for one and a white. Actually, this card's really cool. Magecraft ability. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. All creatures, not just this friend, all of them. Wheeler, what do you think? Well, as the first Magecraft card that we've covered, I think it's appropriate that we probably cover one of the best, if not the best. There might be another one that I just don't associate with that ability. But like, this this is kind of ridiculous, right? Like, <laughs> it's it, Magecraft only ever triggers off of instants and sorceries, whereas prowess, you know, yeah. enchantments, any non-creature. But like... This, like, get, buffing your whole team is really strong. And when we've seen, you know, effects like this in the past, they're often attached to either hard-to-cast bodies or, you know, they're they're just one-ones that have this ability. And they, they have a different mechanic attached to them, but they're effectively the set mechanic buff the team, right? Mm. And... But this one is easier to cast. It's a it's a bear. It's a two mana two two. And then buffing your whole team anytime, like you know, bolt their thing, buff your whole team, cast like an opt in combat, cast any kind of like instant speed protection spells. Ella Damry's called. I, I don't think you'd probably play those in the same deck, but you get what I'm saying. It's like this card can make combat just so miserable, and it's just cheap. It's reasonable. So Jeskai Tempo. Maybe blue white tempo. Any anything tempo? Is this a tempo card or an aggro card? I'll, I'll give it. An, I'll give it a shot in kind of like tempo-y or blitz decks. Probably. I think you could maybe justify it in a Mardu deck as well. Kind of like the Mardu Pyromancer style decks, the ones that play like Seeker of the Way and God Pyromancer with this because it yeah. buffs all the. All, oh my goodness! <laughs> Especially because that's a deck that uses a lot of instants and sorceries proactively, right? Like you're gonna fire off yeah. your duress pre combat, which then if they say want to kill this with a shock, they have to a answer right then, right there, and then you can reactive, you know, d whatever you want, right? Oh, okay, I guess I'll ephemerate some random thing, or I'll bolt you. So it it's just, it kind of like puts the ball in their court in that kind of deck to to react, and often it's going to go poorly, and this card's just going to kill a lot of people. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right, next up, let's talk about Low Shield Clockwork Scholar. This is another card from the Commander set. It's a three mana, two, four legendary elephant artificer for two and a white. Prevents all combat damage that would be dealt to attack attacking artifact creatures you control. And whenever one or more artifact creatures enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card. But this ability only triggers once each turn wheeler i can hear a little excitement in your voice there surge as you're thinking about how you can attack with mem knights i can attack with mem knights and you can just throw a bunch of people in the red zone including loshiel like having a four four toughness i mean that yeah. passes bolts but also just attacks pretty reasonably and again easy to cast so we're talking about ancient two mana here we're talking about you drop this early off of moxin or any kind of acceleration that you are probably going to play in a deck that also has a bunch of artifact creatures drawing once per turn is you know i okay i guess i yeah <laughs> i'm not going to be looping with this which it's is, not even cast it's just etb though right yeah that's that's what i was going to say is like kind of a you know a, a middle ground so again if you are say just making creature tokens through dig site engineer or whatever fact lands artifact lands yeah just anything well this is one or more artifact creatures no you're, you're correct sorry i caught myself yeah but yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean but it is worth saying that it's just another kind of card that fits into this blueprint of a deck that also reinforces a bit more longevity a bit more standing power uh, and also turns your less than stellar late draws into at least you know cards that can cycle and then suit up and just attack and your opponent's just kind of obligated to block most of the time or not block and 
because it's just it, it won't matter, right? My one downfall, the one or one of the downfalls though, is that it's a because it's a static ability, and this is a legend. You'll be attacking. You're like, haha! I you're about to face the wrath of my Phyrexian Revoker, <laughs> and if they Caracas it or they remove it, then well, you might catch yourself in a bit of an awkward situation. Yeah, but, but that's it. All right, let's move on to a card that I think has some of the most welcoming art in the set which is an odd segue, but here we are. Mavinda, Student's Advocate, is a three mana, two, three legendary bird advisor. It should really be an owl, but here we are. Has flying and activated ability zero. You may cast target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard this turn. If that spell doesn't target a creature you control, it costs eight more to cast this way. If that spell would be put into your graveyard, exile it instead. Activate only once each turn. Wheeler. So this card might as well just say you can only cast an instant or sorcery that targets one of your creatures. Like, I guess, you know what? Hey, I'm casting this time walk and I have eight mana hanging around. Oh, no. Great. But that's very, very, very unlikely. Much like whether or not I, you know, am I going to play this? Very, very, very unlikely. Like, I guess rebuying an ephemerate or the protection kind of spells, maybe like a momentary blink is kind of neat. But again, like there you will, you will see some other cards like this in the set where they have these abilities tagged on that kind of reward you for targeting your own creatures. But they're often just more aggressively kind of built in such a way that like, you're just killing people with this card. And then if you are targeting your creatures, well, then you're just killing them even more. Whereas this one just kind of hits this odd kind of like middle ground where I don't think it does enough. And I just can't ever foresee myself playing this card over something like uh, Redain from Kaldheim, the white god that has the same mana cost, same stat line, but added vigilance and flexibility to it and and better static like better abilities yeah yeah just better across the board <laughs> better <laughs> better across the bird all right let's move on then to the first double-faced modal card of our review today we're going to talk about mila crafty companion is a two three legendary fox for one white white and says whenever an opponent attacks one or more planeswalkers you control put a loyalty counter on each planeswalker you control and whenever permanent you control becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, draw a card. And on the opposite side, we have Luca, Wayward Bonder, six mana planeswalker. For four red red, enters with five loyalty, plus one ability, discard a card if you do draw a card. If a creature card was discarded this way, draw two cards instead. Minus two ability, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. It gains haste and exile it at the beginning of your next end step. And minus seven, you get an emblem with whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. Jer, what do you think? I think the MDFCs are pretty interesting. I think you sort of have to evaluate them in sort of like one of two ways is, and that is like, is one of the, the sides powerful enough to see play based on that side alone? Or do you need like the, the variability of being able to play both sides to make it worth including, I guess, or there's a third option in that it's just not not good enough. I think this card fits into the sort of second section. I think both halves are are pretty good, but I don't think I think the planeswalker is probably slightly too expensive to see play just just by itself. And I think the front half Mila is lacking like a keyword or a third third power to really really see play on her own. But I think sort of the combination of them might be worthy of seeing play in like a, a mid-rangey style deck. For some reason, I, I'm thinking Naya. I just want to play it in like a Naya good stuff deck with elves and some big chunguses, like some titans. It is interesting that you want to splash a third color on a card that has white white on one face and red red on the other. Well, like if you're playing Naya mid-range, you can... Your man is perfect. You, you <laughs> cast all your spells. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing what Birds of Paradise can do to a card. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> The big difference between Naya and Mardu is Mardu's cards are way better, but Naya gets to cast all their spells. That's I don't make the rules. <laughs> that's just how it works. Yeah, just, just like there's no really Boros deck that this fits into. I don't think like you, you're not really playing Boros mid range. Like there's just there's just better flavors of mid range that you can play. Yeah, I'm not sure this card really has a home. It's a cool card, but yeah, I think it could potentially see play in like Naya mid range is the the deck that I. I'm imagining when I am trying to jam it in somewhere. 
I'd say maybe, just maybe, and that like red, white stacks artifact deck that Wheeler was describing earlier, just because graveyard matters and wildfires and protecting your planeswalkers, but you're you're probably right. White, white is just like such a cost. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, absolutely, absolutely. But just like put thing in graveyard, get thing out of graveyard is the only reason. More for the graveyard synergy than for like any other face, just the Lucas side. All right, let's move on. Next up, we have Selfless glyph weaver what a mouthful this is a three mana two three human cleric for two and a white exile itself creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn so i guess we now have a selfless cycle and on the other side eight mana black sorcery deadly vanity for five black 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 choose a creature or planeswalker and then destroy all other creatures and planeswalkers. Wheeler, what do you think? You know, just to get that out there on both sides, I don't think I'm ever casting Deadly Vanity, but I also don't know how into casting the Glyph Weaver I necessarily am because, I mean, you, you made mention of Selfless Spirit or at least alluded to it, which kind of fills the role of, hey, I protect your board from wraths or, you know, even just helping your one creature out, right? Helping out a bolt or making combat kind of gross. But Selfless Spirit is is cheaper, has flying, and still hits for two, and can be tutored up by cards like Recruiter of the Guard. Whereas, oddly enough, I think this card, I think I'd be easier on this card if it was a 2-2. Two -two. Like the fact that you can't find this off of something like Recruit of the Guard is a little iffy. And I'm also just not super enthused to be able to exile rather than sacrifice. So I think this card just has a little too much going against it for me to want to play it over something like Selfless Spirit. And they're starting to print more effects like that as well like the new mm -hmm. Lenvala has the same text as well right yeah yeah it's just the, I, I think there are better options and like rarely do you need more than one but if you do those other options just have better bodies attached to them next up let's talk about semester's end this is a four mana instant for three and a white exile any number of target creatures and or planeswalkers you control at the beginning of the next end step, return each of them to the battlefield under its owner's control. Each of them enters the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it if it was a creature, or an additional loyalty if it's a planeswalker. This is just better ghost way, but more expensive. I don't know, Jared, what do you think? Yeah, the fact that it's more expensive definitely definitely matters, but I do think the sort of like permanent anthem effect also, or I guess temporary, and anthem for the creatures you blink effect does matter, and it can also f like... If you sort of like trick your, you can sort of trick your opponent into thinking you're giving up your planeswalker and then you can cast this, reset the planeswalker, fog their attack, your creatures come back bigger as well. It could potentially change the game. So I'm pro I'd probably try it. It obviously goes in the, the blink deck. I think, yeah, definitely good enough to see play there. I think it could be interesting to sort of experiment in, in other decks with a decent number of ETBs, but I don't think it's going to see a huge amount of play. All right, next up, Shaylee, Dean of Radiance. On the front side, we have a two mana, one, one legendary bird cleric for one and a white as a flying and vigilance and a tap ability, tap to put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature that entered the battlefield under your control this turn. And on the other side, we have four mana Embrose, Dean of Shadow. Two black black gets you a legendary human warlock 4-4 four, four. with tap, put a plus one plus one counter on another target creature. Then Ambrose deals two damage to that creature. Whenever a creature you control the plus one plus one counter on it dies, draw a card. Wheeler, what do you think? I feel like maybe I'm, a, I'm going to be a bit too cynical on a card like this because it, it just really feels like it's about three years too late. Or maybe just like before, if this card came out before Eldraine, Maybe I would have been a big fan of it. I, I do like the card. You know, it's again, it's cheap. It has flying and vigilance, which is a pretty deadly combination. It's attached to a less than stellar body. So that's, you know, like we're not, it's no redain. But the ability to just put the counters on every creature that, you know, ETB'd, no matter token or non-token, that's kind of swell. <laughs> I like that you can at least clock in and then, you know, if you throw a sword on it or any kind of equipment, make it, you know, at all kind of intimidating, can muck up their combat. But if you want to just, you know, tap it and buff your team, you have that option. And like, I don't think Embrose 
is I'm not really looking at this card and thinking, and of course, here's Ambrose, but like if I'm playing like an Abzan counters list, I, I don't think you can ignore that side of it, right? Like I think Shale or Shaley, whatever the bird cleric is actually called, the owl. I think the owl <laughs> could maybe find a home outside of just like a counter dependent deck, but I don't think anybody's ever going up to bat just for Ambrose. And if anybody casts that side of the card, it's because they want the whole package for some kind of counter theme. The final card we're going to talk about in white today is Strict Proctor. This is a two mana, one, three flying spirit cleric for one and a white. It has the ability, whenever a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability to trigger, counter that ability unless its controller pays two. What do you think, Wheeler? So Takotli Honor Guard and there's another version of it, Hushwing Griff, I guess are two kind of cheap white D&T style creatures that have a similar ability. They just block out creatures with ETB triggers entirely. And it's it's symmetrical, much like this is. And Hushwing Griff saw a bit of play, mostly as a two power flyer that had Ancient Tomb. I'm doing that thing with my hands. But Takali Arnegard never really kind of showed up. It just I, it did briefly, I guess, but not it's, it's nothing to phone home about. And I think that this isn't going to completely lock people out of the ETBs, but because it affects everything, right? Like it's not just creatures. We're talking mystic sanctuaries and I'm sure there are others, any like enchantment based ones. Even Oblivion yeah. Ring. Yeah. Oblivion Rings, artifacts, if they have ETBs, I, but still mostly creatures, right? Like you're mostly thinking about creatures, but there are some other some other permanent types that will come up while you know they can still technically pay two you can also pay two and if you're playing this in say a death and taxes style deck or a white x kind of dnt deck chances are you have a bunch of mana acceleration form you know fast mana but your curve isn't gigantic like you're you're capping out at four most of the time but you'll have all that fast mana that you can use for mana sinks and so you know it's not ideal but it's also just you know not the end of the world if you have to pay that additional two on your stoneforge mystic sometimes or if you aether vial something out and you have to pay the additional two and then this has flying so it holds equipment well and doesn't have shocks so i have i have a question to flip it turn wise because you talked about how it's not a huge tax effects for the decks that do that what if you wanted to put it in your own stifle not style of deck because it also affects your side and you can let those abilities get countered what about using it proactively to do degenerate things on your side. It's tough because it's a 100 card singleton, right? Well, to fully play into your leading question, whether intentional or not, yeah, I'd absolutely muck around with this in a Stifle Knot deck. Stifle Knot, as we all know, is a well-established archetype. <laughs> You've tried it. You've done well with it, haven't you? Yeah, I guess that's why I'm kind of taking the piss out of it. I'm doing well with it. It's generous. I, <laughs> I, I built the deck, played with it for a day, like for seven hours and I won more than I lost yeah. by a good amount. But I, at the same time, I don't, I don't want to say too many positive things about this because <laughs> like, I don't want to show, I don't want to be placing uh, fighting against like illusionary mask decks on a regular right, basis. Right, right, now. right, right. Yeah. Yeah. But. Cause there are definitely detrimental triggers that exist in cards that people play all the time. That strict proctor will also protect you from a uh, fast mm -hmm. bond is an example yeah, right yeah the bounce lands are another example half of uro is pretty funny half of uro i mean <laughs> any of those any of that cycle isn't fast bond on play not on ETB? it's a it's a permanent etb though isn't it i have to look up hold on i have to look up fast bond because fast bond isn't it's it it's on playing lands because you can still like cast ramp spells with fast bond in play and it doesn't ding whenever you. you play a land if it wasn't the first land you played so it doesn't work on fast bond. No, goozled. All right, fair enough. Sorry to um actually you, but <laughs> I mean no, yeah, you're, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it doesn't work with fast bond. <laughs> that's okay <laughs> by me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so stifle not maybe a little too mimi. My fast bond dreams are gone. I mean, you you can stifle not with it if you want. Unfortunately, your fast bond dreams, no matter where you yeah. play it, are still gone. But I think this card is just also just fine and overall just 
pretty reasonable. And a spirit. It's a playable two-drop spirit. I'm keeping my eyes peeled. I got some supreme phantoms I want to cast. There's some good spirits in this set, but you're right. Let's move on. Let's move on. All right. Welcome to a brand new segment called the Jer Power Hour, maybe less than an hour. We finally figured out what to do with blue cards. Let's just jump right into it. Archmage Emeritus, four mana two to human wizard, two blue blue. Magecraft, when have you cast or copied instant or sorcery, draw a card. It's everything I've ever wanted. <laughs> I'm going to play this card in so many decks that I shouldn't, but I'm still going to win. So it's fine. Like, I just want to put this and play this in high tide and just spin my wheels harder than wheels have ever been spun before. <laughs> I don't actually think there's a deck where you need to play this card, but there's a lot of decks where you could play this card and I'm going to, I'm going to explore. I think you don't like memeing aside. I, I thought about this card, maybe just maybe in like a curb your enthusiasm like blue green like i'm I, I was trying to think about it with like if i'm casting this on turn three how do i feel yeah it's just the odds of it living are so like I, I know if it does you're happy but yeah like it dies to shock yeah at least it's not legendary this is this feels like the classic card of like you're gonna play in a bunch of places where you know you shouldn't and i'll never talk about the instances where it, you know you play it and it immediately gets shocked but i will absolutely talk about the 12 cards that drew me when yeah. it just survived <laughs> it's just like let's forget all the bad stuff like it's gonna live 10 10 percent of the time but the stories you get from that 10 oh yeah you're, <laughs> it'll just be like oh i kicked their ass like i had this emeritus out just countering they couldn't get rid of it oh it was brutal yeah card's great Next up, draw spell curate one in a blue instant. Look at the top two cards of your library. Put any number of them into your graveyard and the rest back on top of the top of your library in any order. Then draw a car. Jer. I like this card. It's like an instant speed version of that surveil card they printed a little while ago. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, that one. Yeah, I, I think this is this is pretty good. Decks are good at utilizing the graveyard these days, if you weren't already aware. And cantrips that incidentally put cards in your graveyard are are getting better and better like people finally figured out they should probably just be jamming faithless looting in every red deck i'm i'm not even exaggerating put it in every red deck and yeah more more to follow including this one play it that's good <laughs> all right well then more to follow we got multiple choice x and blue this one's going to take me a while to read through there's a lot of words it's a sorcery if x is one scry one then draw a card if X is two, choose a player. They return a creature they control to their owner's hand. If X is three, you get a four, four blue and red elemental creature token. And if X is four or more, do all of the above. This card is so sweet. It's my second favorite card in the set. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a lot of this card. It does it all. Ideally, you want to be casting it for, for five. I think... 90% of the time you're either going to be casting it for two mana or five mana and that that is perfectly acceptable the other 10% are you're casting it on well nine percent you're casting it for four mana and then if your opponent has just created merit Lage on their turn for some reason and <laughs> it's their only creature then that is the one percent that makes up your casting list for three mana all right Good, good evaluation. Next up, a commander card, Octavia, Living Thesis, is a 10 mana, 8-8 eight, eight legendary elemental octopus for 8 and a blue blue. But this spell costs 8 less to cast if you have 8 or more instant and or sorcery cards in your graveyard. Ward 8 being the new keyword ability that's basically just Frost Titan. And Magecraft, of course, it has more abilities. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery, target creature has base power and toughness 8-8 eight, eight until end of turn, Jer. The art is sweet. Yeah, I, I just think there's the hoop you have to jump through in order to cast this card is, is too high and too small. For those of you who have tried to cast Bedlam Reveler for two mana reliably, you'll know the, the struggle that is that, and this is too harder than that so i just think it's 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 a little too unreliable to cast in a reasonable manner like when when you need it if you're looking to reanimate something i think this is this is probably pretty reasonable it's very difficult for your opponent to remove ward eight might as well just be hexproof apart from uncounterable spells i guess you can you can target it with uncounterable spells but there's there's not many of those like abrupt decay doesn't matter it's perfect because then you can just give all your like woo spies 
and Voldalian <laughs> merchants. You could just make them eight eights, kill them with like thought couriers and merfolk looters. That is pretty sweet. So yeah, I could see it playing it in reanimator deck, but I think most people think of this as, oh yeah, I'm gonna cast all the ponders and thought seizes and then cast this for two mana. And I, I think that dream is a little a little unrealistic, but I'm I'm definitely on team like animate dead this thing all right another favorite returning segment rate that counter spell 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 let me introduce reject this is a two mana instant for one and a blue counter target creature or planeswalker unless its controller pays three if that spell is countered this way exile it instead instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard what do you think jer i love whoever is on the design team at watsi and it's just like Whenever a card gets put in front of them, they're just writing or planeswalker on it and hoping that as many of those get approved as possible. <laughs> they're they're my new favorite person. Yeah, I think this card is likely fine if you're going quite deep on on counter spells. It's definitely more of a more of a tempo card than a control card, I think. Partially because it's a it's a soft counter and it's it's not double blue and it's only two mana so you're probably gonna only gonna cast this if you're not really looking to cast three mana counter spells and you're playing all of the better two mana ones and one mana ones so i don't know if there's a deck that really wants it but if you find a spot for it it's definitely worth trying out i think it looks pretty reasonable to me exiling is is getting more and more relevant as well so if you play it you'll you'll definitely get some scenarios where you'll you'll tag something and exiling it will matter all right the final blue card to talk about is solve the equation it's a three mana sorcery for two and a blue search your library for an instant or sorcery card reveal it put it into your hand and then shuffle man i forgot about this card i was looking through earlier and i'm like sweet they didn't print any busted highlander cards <laughs> there's this one i was like oh damn it definitely definitely thought while looking at the blue i was like oh that's a nice change you know there's not some wicked blue card out there yeah this card's this card's absurd goes in every combo deck ever a bunch of people will play it in recall decks and it'll be fine goes in curb goes in scape shift goes in yeah goes in most you know it's kind of baffling right like it feels like uh oh yeah they haven't made this you know we got the idyllic tutor and fabricate why is it instant or sorcery with no cmc yeah you know cap like like even if they made it sorcery you yeah know, sure just make it a sorcery tie call it yeah make it a sorcery and be like oh because we only wanted people to be able to find the lessons that they include in their main deck or whatever reason you want to give but jesus why like this i mean i'm happy because the deck I most want to play right now, I'm I'm brewing up blue red high tide, <laughs> and this this makes cutting black feel better. So goodbye demonic tutor. For that reason and only that reason, am I like kind of stoked? But yeah, the this card's silly and doesn't make sense to me. Now I'm gonna ask a rhetorical question here, just just so we can start the conversation. Why is a three mana sorcery this oppressive that both of you are just like, oh no? Well, I mean, for for reference, a lot of the the combo decks in the format are playing transmute spells, largely to find instants and sorceries. And transmute spells are a lot less versatile than this. Like you're putting in transmute spells to find typically key key combo pieces and you'll often include a couple utility cards of, at the same mana cost in order to make the transmute spell a little a little better and so you can stomach playing it but this card just negates the need to do that whatsoever you can get anything you want in the world <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right. uh, the following cards are instants and sorceries. Yogmoss Will, Tendrils of Agony, Dark Ritual, High Tide, Time Walk, Ancestral Recall, Second Sunrise, Scape Prop Shift. Rotation, Scape Shift. So this is not a problem of uh, the card itself being powerful, but the card pool it opens up being powerful. I mean, sure, but it's it's well established that our, our card pool is every card ever printed. It's a flexible, easy to cast tutor with no downside. All right. Which I think is pretty scary. I mean, when you put it that way. This is only slightly <laughs> worse than Mystical Tutor. Cool. All right. You ready to move on to red cards? Yeah. Yes. Let's start off with Conspiracy Theorist. Two mana, two, two, human shaman for one and a red. Whenever it attacks, you may pay a generic and discard a card. If you do, draw a card. And then whenever you discard one or more Nod land cards, you may exile one of them from your graveyard. If you do, you may cast it this turn. What do you think, Wheeler? It's a very good effect. Both of them are very good effects, and it's attached to a bear. It's, we, I, I don't know, maybe, I think maybe the name is just kind of throwing me off. 
<laughs> because like it is it just feels very like unset name you know mm. but the only un here is unfortunate circumstances thus the in the in the way that that's what my opponent will be in when i get to play this guy good you, you got the, you got that you nailed it you nailed it hey what straight path yeah it's fine i mean the fact that you get to the the cost on the looting or the rummaging rather is a little not that great but uh, the fact that it only has to attack and not actually connect means that you can, you know, occasionally bump into some wall of blossoms or coiling oracles or whatever and still get the ability. And there are more ways to discard, you know, in the game than just this. Faithless Looting, Royal Scions, uh, Careful Study, Liliana. Your opponent casts Thoughtseize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like anything, really. <laughs> Gives everything madness, which is a cooler way to look at it instead of trying to set it up in a different way. Not quite right, because like I said, your opponent thought seizing you, but if your opponent doesn't thought seize an instant or spell with flesh, right, 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 doesn't mm-hmm. get around those. Ex- but this this does kind of fit again into like that Mardu deck or just like a bl- uh, red black deck where you're getting card advantage that isn't necessarily just you know harmonizes or whatever, but instead just allowing you to play these more selection kind of oriented cards or attrition cards and still get out ahead of something that is effectively going to be some metrical or like balanced by the fact that well it's now in your graveyard i like this card i guess is what i'm trying to say (laughs) i like this card next up we have draconic intervention this is a four mana sorcery for two red red as an additional cost to cast the spell exile an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard and then draconic intervention deals x damage to each non-dragon creature where x is the exiled card's mana value if a creature dealt damage this way would die exile it instead and then exile the intervention what do you think jer i think this card is kind of interesting the exile clauses is, is nice but i'm not sure that makes it worth playing over some of the more reliable wraths that don't require you to have a reasonably sized instant or sorcery in your in your graveyard so i powerful effect too many hoops yeah i just think the for cards you need to cast when you're like my plan is to to not die you want as, <laughs> as few hoops and as you want them as reliable as possible and this card just isn't super reliable totally fair all right fervent mastery is up next it's a five mana sorcery for three red red but you may pay two red red rather than pay the spell's mana cost If the two red red cost was paid, an opponent discards any number of cards, then draws that many cards. And then you get to search your library for up to three cards, put them into your hand, shuffle, and then discard three cards at random. Jer, what do you think? I think if you're playing the card Underworld Breach in your deck and you're planning to win the card with the card Underworld Breach, uh, you will want to put this card Fervent Mastery in your deck. So this busted combo card is what you're saying? I don't think it's busted, but like if you get to cast this card and then untap and the card Underworld Breach was in your deck, then you're probably going to win on the next <laughs> turn. <laughs> I think that out of the mastery kind of cards where, you know, the uh, the alternative cost that is often cheaper is usually more geared to like a multiplayer setting like even if they are in Strixhaven proper like they do very much have like a commander kind of feel to Mm. them right this this is one of the masteries though where like you can pay that lower cost and get your opponent to who cares if they discard their cards and draw more like they're dead (laughs) right yeah I, i should have mentioned this card costs four not five yeah, it's it's four mana for three gambles, which is three in tombs, and that's pretty strong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll pay the extra one to be able to not have to just find creatures off of like Buried Alive. Not to mention that this also being red too, right? Like in, in the Storm decks that play Pyretic Ritual, Desperate Ritual, Seething Song, you'll play them because you technically have red cards and you want to play rituals to get up to your seven mana or whatever, but you can now use those rituals right into this card and just kill people dead. 
you don't need any dark rituals. This this and breach. I mean, hey, that's it's all good there. All right. Next up, Flame Scroll Celebrant. This is another double faced modal card. The front face is a two mana two on human shaman for one and a red. Whenever an opponent activates an ability that isn't a mana ability, F Flame Scroll Celebrant deals one damage to that player. And then it also has some weird variation of Flame Scroll Breathing. Sure, one and a, one and a red gets plus two plus zero oh until end of turn. It's not fire breathing. It's not a single red. So I, I don't know. I, I panicked. No, you, I, I think you did well. I, I liked it. Uh, flame. I liked flame, flame scroll breathing. <laughs> Uh, the other side is Revel in Silence. This is an instant for white. White, your opponent can't cast spells or activate Planeswalker loyalty abilities this turn. Exile Revel in Silence. Jer, what do you think? I think this is one of those cards that fits into the category where you're likely only going to plan to cast Flame Scroll Celebrant, and that's just fine as a two drop. This goes in basically any aggressive red deck. Like you'd play it in red green, you'd play it in mono red, you'd play it in red white if that's the thing you want to do. But you don't need to be able to cast the backside to make the front side worthwhile. But if you can cast the backside, it might come up every now and again. But yeah, just the just the front side is definitely good enough to see play. That's absolutely the worst part is that there are green red players that will have Savannah and Plateau for their like wild Nacodles. And sometimes those decks go as deep as like Undiscovered Paradise. I'm and I'm going to get got. Just nodding. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've I've done that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just gonna be like, oh, cool. Mana confluence, city of brass. Yeah, the classic thing off my curd ape opponent <laughs> is ruining everything I want. Yeah. Oh no! Amazing. Well, no, they're gonna silence Ben. What <laughs> with in response to Yogmoth's will. <laughs> Great. Oh no! <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Beautiful. Amazing. Okay. We have another commander card here. Let's talk about Lelia. How is my pronunciation there? Passable? I'd say so. I for a made up name, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> Sounded good to me. Lelia the Blade Reforged is a three mana two two legendary spirit warrior for ancient tomb and a red. It has haste, and whenever it attacks, exile the top card of your library. You may play that card this turn. Whenever you exile one or more cards from your library and or graveyard, put a plus one plus one counter. On Lelia. Sorry, I started laughing. That's okay. <laughs> no, it's, I, I appreciate it, Serge. You know, every time I say ancient tomb mana, because this is a an audio medium, uh, you can't see that I'm saying tomb as in T W O M E M B. Oh God, uh, cut, can we cut that out? And then mana, N A N A M B, manam. Yeah, manam. Manam. Yeah, you know, Quebecois, manam, manam, c'est tout chéré. Anyways, this card's, I like it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> really, really, why? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked, Jared. I think it's about time Spirit Tribal got the love it deserves. Why does it have haste? Oh, I love it's so good. And the, like, why does it, why is it a slith that gets the counter before damage? <laughs> before hitting, right? They even made the art cool. Like the yeah. art, like yeah. it's just everything about this is great. And like, and honestly, yeah, it's a spirit. Yeah, there's a little Kamigawa love over there. Hey, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I haven't mean, even mentioned it's a warrior, which is the more relevant creature type. Yeah, I guess that's also <laughs> fine. I mean, there's a bunch of good warriors that have been printed and that deck's totally reasonable now. But importantly, yeah, this card's great. Easy to cast, hits hard. Its ability will trigger off of anything. Like you have Grim Labamancer. Draws you an extra card a turn. Lavamancer, not flashback spells. I think that's relevant to, somewhat relevant to say because, you know. They go to the stack. Yeah. Delve spells. Death Rite Scoos. Yeah, exactly. This is, yeah, this card's great. <laughs> it's so good. It's definitely one of the best cards from from this group. Oh, uh, yeah. For our format. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite good. I wonder if I could use like Scrabbling Claws with this card. <laughs> Oh, like mm. <laughs> you just excel your own stuff. I I knew I know what you're playing. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good, huh? <laughs> I mean, you'll still kill people with it. That doesn't make it a good plan. It just means this card's cracked in half. <laughs> yeah, I'll still kill people with it in, a, in my spirit tribal deck. What was that wisdom that Jer dropped the other day? Don't include bad cards to make your good cards better, Wheeler. You mean that wisdom that neither Jer nor I have ever followed and <laughs> has not been punished for? <laughs> All right, right, that's fair. That's fair. Cool. Let's move on. We got Plarg, 
Dean of Chaos. This is a two mana, two, two legendary orc shaman right out of World of Warcraft here. Tap, discard a card to draw a card, and then five and tap, so four and a red. Reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a non legendary, non land card with mana value three or less. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Put all revealed cards not cast this way on the bottom of your library in a random order. And then on the other side, we have Agosta, Dean of Order. Three mana, one three legendary human cleric for two and a white. Other Tapped creatures you control get plus one plus O. Oh. Other untapped creatures you control get plus zero plus one. And whenever you attack, untap each creature you control, then tap any number of creatures you control. What? Sorry. It's so you can set set whichever mode you want. Yeah. I just so weird though but you're you are correct wheeler what do you think I, I gotta tell you i got a headache reading through this card like right same it's, it's it's just one of these cards where like maybe it's the pandemic talking but but i kind of just want to <laughs> i like look at it and i'm like oh like yeah all of this is pretty good but i'm just so tired I, I, can i just play like silver knight <laughs> or something oh yeah i'm too i'm too lazy to figure out if it's good yeah can we bring up can we bring up Lelia again <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't don't need to think about that one. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> element, yeah. Haha, <laughs> legend, XL card, go brrr. Yeah, it, it's just like Plarg. Okay, so both of these sides are reasonable. I think together they work really well. The fact that it will be in your deck as Plarg is pretty cool because you can find it off of Recruiter of the Guard. Or Imperial Recruiter. Yeah, you could, like if you have a deck with like Luris and this card or like Unearth or whatever, you know, you can maybe play it for the Augusta and then get it back for the Plarg. Plarg's ability is technically an ability. Like that's a five mana mana sink that's pretty good. I like the the insight. It's that ability sure is technically an ability. That's literally this card though. Is it's just like uh, yeah, it's like okay, great. So we have this bear with two <laughs> abilities that are both pretty reasonable, and if that's not not enough then you also just have this flip side with this a, a bunch of abilities that are also pretty reasonable <laughs> like it's like somebody saying like hey ben here's this painting that is like here's here's the mona lisa i'll give it to you for four thousand dollars or whatever and it's like well i mean i'd probably make money on this but why is this happening and like will i get in trouble like it's just not worth it like it's not worth it there's just so i mean and, it, but, and by not worth it i mean it's there's just so much going on it's hard hard to say no to it because all these effects are strong it's flexible enough and like there's genuine utility in both like say a mono white deck or even like a white red deck you know it could be something like untapping grim lava mancer to bring that card up again or giant killer you know those kind of things just giving big things effectively vigilance pretty good with glory bringer if that ever comes up but i don't think glory bringer needs much help like there's just a lot of words on this card and a lot of them are pretty good and I'm probably just going to save some time and, and to play a worse card that's easier to follow. Good with on crop crasher, Ben. Oh, yeah, but not. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you love it, on crop crasher. Well, I think that's what I mean, right? Is because like now that Jer mentions it, like yeah, I could talk about how you know a three drop like on crop crasher being able to untap it is going to be genuinely a, a huge boon, whereas something like glory bringer feels like win more. But like there's just a lot of nuance in it, and maybe again, maybe I've just been softened up by new cards plus pandemic. But I just want to be like, oh, look at all the look at all these words on the card. You think a card with this many words? all of them good is going to be bad well that's that's the problem they're not all like obscenely good they're all like yeah exactly they're all like a seven out of ten and what is a seven out of ten really like yeah yeah the, the problem is yeah you're absolutely correct they've added so many medium lines that you're like are there enough medium lines that this is good i can't tell but it's all fine yeah maybe maybe the mona lisa was a bad example yeah it's like what if i got movie you get it's like somebody giving you free movie tickets but you can only ever see movies that have like a rating of like seven out of ten they're like they're <laughs> free but i could do other things with yeah my it's time. like that's still a time requirement and i'm gonna buy popcorn i guess but like i can't believe how long we've been talking about plarg are we really talking about plarg though I mean, I'm looking at Augusta. See, this is what I mean. It's hard to keep track. <laughs> also, talking about Plarg, we haven't even announced that that's a new series we're going to... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Coming this Monday. Let's talk about Plarg. 
right, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on to cards that Wheeler is excited to talk about, like Rowan and Will. What? <laughs> yeah. All right. We got a new double face modal card. They've been separated. You got to keep them separated, Wheeler. Good. Well, no, they were separated before. Now <laughs> they're together. <laughs> no, they were together on the Royal Scions. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, they were separate, then they were together, and now they're separate again. And I don't even have to look at or think about Will if I don't want to. Uh, sorry, Serge, go ahead. Three mana gets you a two loyalty Rowan Planeswalker for two and a red. There's a static ability, instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one gener generic less to cast. Plus one ability, Rowan deals one damage to each opponent. If you've drawn three or more cards this turn, deal three damage instead. Minus four, you get an emblem with whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you may pay two. If you do, copy that spell. Spell. You may choose new targets for that copy. And on the other side, we have five mana will Scholar of Frost. So four and a white gets you four loyalty. Instant and sorcery spells cost one less to cast, same as the other side. Plus one, up to one target creature has base power and toughness 02 until your next turn. Minus three, draw two cards. And then minus seven, exile up to five target permanents. For each permanent exiled this way, its controller creates a 4-4 four, four red blue elemental creature token. Take it away, Wheeler. I literally tried to unmute my mic to start talking three times because I thought you were done. I, there's just so many words on this card and I don't know if altogether it makes a card or two cards that I'm super excited about. Like, I feel like this falls into this category of card that we see now where it's like, okay, this card is, it does some powerful things, but also also, like, so do all the other cards I'm playing. And do I really, like, what deck am I playing this in where I'm totally comfortable with this kind of card like Rowan having such low loyalty costs leaves it very vulnerable to basically all all forms of removal like getting Rowan off the table super easy and then Will we're talking like a five mana planeswalker that even the plus one you know it's nice to be able to brick uh, a creature if that creature's got counters if that creature has a reasonable ability if that creature has its power modified in any way shape or form you know it, it's still game and so i i just like i'm looking at these cards and i'm like when am i ever going to play this and think this was the correct decision to include these cards in my deck i'm going to play them but i don't think i'll play them be like oh this was we, we did the math this was right like this is correct like like again like i'm thinking maybe like the heartbeat turns deck that deck has gotten a lot of love recently for you know in, in spots where it wanted a little chin scratch if you will maybe this shows up in the high tide deck that jerry's been talking about blue red but like i, I just again fine but underwhelming yeah it's just i it, it's just like why am i playing it yeah that's fair i like i like how we write this off but we like plarg i actually quite like this card oh talk chair i actually think it's re even reasonable in like blue moon because yeah. because like you can play the three mana side against controller combo, and then you have like the threat of a three mana planeswalker, which is it's just like the bar to win with a three mana planeswalker and the control mirror, or just like get a threat out against combo that helps enable you later on in the game. It's very, very useful. Rowan does ultimate pretty quickly. And like by no means, by no means am I saying like it's bad, right? Like yeah, I want to yeah. be clear. But it's just, it's the kind of card where I won't be super surprised. Like, I wouldn't be too surprised if it popped up and I died to it or people or if people played it against me and i wouldn't like kind of be like oh why is this happening you know like, yeah and i um, i think it's a slam dunk in the i played like a rug planeswalker time walk deck yeah it's a it's a slam dunk in that deck yeah it's a planeswalker that makes your time walks cheaper it's easy to cast <laughs> wins wins the game eventually if you cast the Rowan, you're you're probably you have a pretty good shot of twin casting time walks for the rest of the game. Will draws you a bunch of cards. Wincy the game makes it harder for your opponent to do stuff. 
I think, yeah, I think, I think it's maybe just, I'm, I'm getting too old for this <laughs> in like, a t- <laughs> in like a tough love version of like, if there's a card that reinforces pre-existing archetypes that, you know, need that leg up or whatever, like the soul sisters decks, a certain tribal decks or whatever. I'm like, hell yeah, play this card's what you need. Like glad of it. Love to see more of it. And then a card like this shows up cheap planeswalker blue red. It's like, oh, you think you're good, huh? And it's like smack the ball out of its hand. <laughs> like it's just like prove it. Wow. I mean, that's fair. That, that bias is definitely legit. All right. Shall we take it home to our final red card of the day? Our yep. final card card of the day. Let's plarg, baby. It's another dwarf. We're going to talk about the Storm Kiln Artist. Four mana, two, two, dwarf shaman for three and red. It gets plus one, plus oh for each artifact you control. And Magecraft, whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, create a treasure token. Wheeler, take us home. So it is a four mana, two, two. Yeah, originally I cut this. I didn't think it was good enough and you added it. So I'm very curious about your thoughts. Oh, I thought I accidentally cut this. Like I thought when I was pruning some stuff, I accidentally deleted this, but it must have just been within a small window. I I do think it's worth talking about because there have been, I've seen some Academy players like Paradox players mention it as a a potential build because, you know, we have a whole bunch of Wheel of Fortunes now in just blue and red. And if we want to go to Turbo Town on just like a blue red build, yeah, it's a 2-2, but like we're looking about playing it in a deck that is either just casting this and then killing your opponent immediately, or you're casting it and going, well, do you have it? And if they don't, then you're killing them immediately. But again, like I always try to say like paradox decks and Academy decks, we don't need better win conditions like that. Winning the game has never been an issue, but this card kind of just fits in the middle of like, it helps you keep going, cycling through your deck and can like, like, you know, combo kill an infinite people, but it can also theoretically pivot to winning the game. So I'm going to give it a shot ju- mostly because there have been some people that have pushed forward reasonable discussion points surrounding it. But I would like if it if it turns out that it's real bad, <laughs> that I'm not going to be like, oh, I, oh, no, I was so off the mark. It'll just be like, oh, OK, well, sorry, dwarf. <laughs> yeah. Catch you later. All right. With that, friends, that's going to do it for our episode today. Thank you so much for listening. A reminder that this podcast is brought to you by you. Your support over at the Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. Hope you enjoyed part one. We'll be back with part two and part three in the weeks to come. So look forward to that. Thank you so much for listening and bye-bye.